Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Eduardo Patrick Beltran. Uh, I'm a internal medicine doctor and also a dermatologist. Where I work within the field of integrative functional medicine. And I'm also a vitamin D expert. Today, today's presentation is going to be on single nucleotide polymorphisms of vitamin D genes and the benefits of high dose vitamin D therapy. A revolutionary approach for treating autoimmune and infectious diseases. So, welcome to this presentation, and uh, let's go ahead and begin. So, let's start off talking about a little bit of the vitamin D physiology. And as we know, vitamin D comes from the sun. And as soon as the ultraviolet B rays touches our skin, it gets in contact with a form of cholesterol known as 7-D hydrocholesterol, which is... Uh, transformed into cholecalciferol, known as also vitamin D3. This vitamin D3 will eventually bind to a protein known as vitamin D binding protein. And this cholecalciferol, or also known as vitamin D3, is that vitamin D3 that we usually find at the supermarkets and also at the pharmacies. So cholecalciferol, once it binds to its vitamin D binding protein, it will be transported all the way to the liver. And here we have an enzyme by the name of 25-hydroxylase, which is made thanks to the upregulation of a gene known as uh, CYP2R1. Um, this gene will produce 25-hydroxylase, which will transform cholecalciferol into its preactive form known as calcifidyl, or also 25-hydroxyvitamin D. Uh, calcifidyl will eventually bind once again to vitamin D binding protein in, and will travel all the way to the kidneys nearby the proximal convoluted tubule where there is a specific enzyme by the name of 1-alpha-25-hydroxylase which is upregulated by a gene known as CYP27B1 and this enzyme will eventually transform calcifidyl into the active vitamin D or the hormone itself known as calcitriol also known as 1-25-hydroxyvitamin D. Eventually once again, uh, this vitamin D binding protein will transport the calcitriol all the way to the different tissues where we have um, vitamin D receptors, such as the brain, kidneys, skin, bones, joints, lungs, the liver, pancreas, eyes, heart, and blood vessels, and mainly the digestive tract. As you can see, I put it in red because it's at the level of the digestive tract or the gastrointestinal system where the immune system is located. As we know, 80% of our immune cells are found in our digestive tract. So, let us not forget as well that calcifidyl acts upon it, uh, the vitamin D receptors so, uh, that are found on immune cells, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, up ahead. So, if we look at a normal person, uh, we can see that if this whole system is intact, Right? and there are no polymorphisms in regarding to these genes. Uh, let's say if this person is taking around 10,000 international units a day, technically, they should be making also 10,000 corresponding uh, to, of calcifidyl and 10,000 corresponding to calcitriol. That is, if the system is intact and there are no polymorphisms to any of these genes, correct? But... Usually, in a person who has an autoimmune disease, one of the things that we see is that if they start taking 10,000 over here, this enzyme is going to transform it into 10,000 over here, and then eventually, this enzyme is going to take place, but if we have a polymorphism that's uh, affecting this enzyme, that's going to be made and transformed into 1,000. So here we have 10,000, 10,000, and 1,000. So we have a problem in the conversion of calcifidyl into calcitriol because of the presence of a polymorphism known as uh, a polymorphism that produces a defective enzyme or not enough of this enzyme that helps in the conversion of 25-hydroxy to 125-hydroxy vitamin D. Okay. So let's carry on. Let's say if we have, we're taking 20,000 over here and we see that it gets transformed into 5,000 and this later on gets transformed into 1,000. Well, here we have two polymorphisms. We have one over here on that, uh, this gene, uh, CYP2R1, which is making a defective enzyme for 
such as 25 hydroxylase. And here we have another polymorphism, which is also, uh, you know, uh, not converting the amounts of vitamin D uh, into its appropriate amounts. So we have two polymorphisms that are existent and that can actually cause severe vitamin D deficiency in some of these patients. Now, let us not forget that we also have polymorphisms of the VDR gene, which are receptors that are located in the surface of the cells, and also these can be found in the nucleus of the cells. So these VDR receptors are upregulated by a gene known as VDR gene. And sometimes, a lot of patients who have autoimmune diseases have polymorphisms of this gene. So as you can see, this is calcitriol. It fits perfectly. So this is a normal VDR receptor. It has good affinity for calcitriol, but patients who have a polymorphism of their VDR gene sometimes will not have that affinity as they require. And so this is one of the reasons why we have to give very high doses of vitamin D to be able to push in and saturate these receptors and try to activate them in order to get the response that we would like. So here we can see there's a vitamin D receptor polymorphism that has bad affinity for vitamin D active form. So the types of vitamin D polymorphisms are the following. We can have polymorphism of the gene CYP2R1, which is responsible of making 25-hydroxylase, which transforms cholecalciferol into calcifidyl. We can have a polymorphism of the gene CYP27B1, which makes 1-alpha-25-hydroxylase, which transforms calcifidyl into calcitrol, which is the active form of vitamin D. And we also may have polymorphisms of the vitamin D binding protein. Now, this is a protein that's responsible of transporting calcitrol, calcifidyl, and cholecalciferol. But there are some other functions that can be attributed to the vitamin D binding protein. Because as we know, it serves as a carrier and reservoir for major vitamin D metabolites throughout the whole endocrine system, but it is also known to mediate several biological functions in humans, such as including immune system modulation, osteoclast activation, chemotaxis activation, and fatty acid transport. Now, there's also something very important in regards to cancer. As we know, the vitamin D by D protein is a precursor molecule of a potent macrophage activating factor that is highly tumoricidal against various malignancies through its ability to inhibit endothelial angiogenesis. So basically, it stops the production of angiogenesis. And it also stimulates, stimulates inflammation-induced phagocytic activity of tumoricidal macrophages. So this is a really important gene that helps in fighting combating cancer. Then we have the VDR gene, which is found in every single cell in our body. Right? It's present in all of our cells in our body. Some cells may need, to be, may, may need to upregulate these receptors, but in essence, they're found throughout the whole body. The only cells that, according to the literature, that so far we haven't been able to identify these VDR cells are the Purkinje cells that are found in the heart. But maybe, perhaps down the road, this might change. So here's something that I would like to go ahead and, and mention around, about the VDR gene receptors is that the immune system um, has VDR genes for both of these, for calcifidyl and also for calcitriol, okay? And the reason why this is very important is because um, the presence of having uh, calcifidyl receptors, right, or VDR receptors for calcifidyl, is because all of the innate immune cells um, have, a, a, have a converting enzyme, are e well equipped with a, in a, a converting enzyme that transforms calcifidyl into calcitriol. So we don't have to wait for kidney metabolism in order to make calcitriol. We can basically get calcifidyl and transform it into calcitriol intracellularly. Okay, And this is something fantastic that our immune cell does because it's a way of being able to... Um, be more economic and not have to waste time in order to be able to make our own calcitriol at the level of the kidneys. And the reason why uh, vitamin D3 easily gets confer con uh, conversed, uh, transformed into calcifidyl and gives a very large benefit to patients who are infected, uh, let's say, with 
some viral infection, as we'll see up front. Okay. So let's not forget that there's also another gene that breaks down vitamin D. And here we have the CYP24A1 gene that makes an enzyme known as 24 hydroxylase. And this is the one that's going to be responsible for breaking down the active form of vitamin D. Okay. Now, patients who have mutations or polymorphisms of this gene obviously are not going to have a 24 hydroxylase that's going to be breaking down adequate amounts of calcitrol. And this could lead to nephrocalcinosis, um, kidney stones, hypercalcemia, uh, increased calcium levels in the blood. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. So let me go ahead now and talk about this uh, specific clinical case of a patient of mine. And this is a patient who had rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, as you can see, uh, it's a 53-year-old female patient. She's a teacher. And uh, she had joint pain in both of her knees and both hands for five years. And also in her fingers. And uh, were associated with uh, morning stiffness. That improved throughout the day. And there was, absence, uh, there was the absence of TOFs. Uh, the patient was also using certain medications such as uh, NSAIDs as ibuprofen and Tylenol to control the pain. And the clinic was very suggestive and compatible with rheumatoid arthritis. So we went ahead and uh, did some uh, lab work. And obviously this is a patient of mine from the state of Santa Catarina in Brazil. And that's where I practice uh, as a physician over there. And uh, we did a whole bunch of different lab works and her rheumatoid factor came back positive. As you can see right over here, uh, the, the, the levels of her rheumatoid factor was 46.2 international units per milliliter. And normal would be anything that's below 14. So she came back positive for rheumatoid arthritis. So obviously the thing that we ended up doing was putting her on our protocol, which is the LGS protocol, also known as the leaky gut syndrome protocol, is that we put her on a high dose vitamin D uh, supplementation and also gave her magnesium uh, vitamin k2 alpha lipoic acid alpha lipoic acid is really important for giving uh, support for the liver especially in phase one and phase two liver metabolism and we'll talk I'll show you a little bit about that up front you know um, and but it's very important to give the vitamin B family over here because these all participate in the methylation process and it's extremely important that we give patients who are taking high doses of vitamin d the support of these vitamins as b2 b6 b9 b12 um, because these two especially b9 and b12 they must be given in the methyl form because they help in the methylation cycle vitamin a obviously is essential it's very important because it's a cofactor for vitamin d in order for it to be activated Zinc is essential as well. Certain minerals that are also important uh, that are conforming part of our, 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 of our protocol and certain amino acids that will help restore a little bit more of those tight junctions that we'll see up ahead, okay? Such as L-glutamine. Probiotics are very important. And if there is the presence of SIBO or CIFO or a combination of both, obviously those two must be treated accordingly. Um, now, here's the most important part of the protocol is the diet. So this, these patients must uh, undergo a very restrictive anti-inflammatory diet, which is, which is free of gluten, lectins, dairy, and sugars. Okay? Now, why this is very important is because these uh, proteins uh, or these uh, foods are very pro-inflammatory and also increase the uh, permeability at the level of the gut inducing what we know as leaky gut syndrome so in order for us to be able to reverse this we have to take out the foods that are causing the leaky gut okay so what are the laboratory exams that we use for patients who have autoimmune diseases with the LGS protocol well as you can see we measure 25 hydroxy vitamin D 125 hydroxy vitamin D the parathyroid hormone um, ionic calcium, serum calcium, calciuria, um, B9, methylfolate, B12, methylcobalamin. Um, and uh, obviously we have to see how the liver is functioning and the, and the kidneys are functioning. So um, something that I would like to go ahead and add and say here is that sometimes we do have some patients who have fatty liver 
or maybe even cirrhosis. So these patients may not perhaps benefit from vitamin D3, and we might actually have to give them calcifidile, right? Or if we have a kidney patient, um, maybe we won't be able to give them calcifidile because they can't convert it, and they'll require calcitriol. So it's important to have this at the back of our mind. And obviously, we're going to be looking for autoantibodies specific for the autoimmune disease that we are investigating, correct? These are just the major um, uh, lab work that we do. There is obviously other lab works that we also incorporate that are important. But these are the main ones that we I would like to go ahead and share with you. So here is our case. So we have our patient. Before starting her high dose, we did her lab work in regards to we did her measurements in regards to her vitamin D, and as you can see, her 23, or 25, excuse me, hydroxyvitamin D was 21. It was low. Normal reference, uh, for, according to this lab, is 30 to 60. Uh, some other labs is 30 to 100. And here we have the actual hormone, the 125-dehydroxyvitamin D, which was very low. So it was 16.3, as we can see, right? Normal reference is 19.9 to 79.3. So... We have established that this patient who has rheumatoid arthritis does have a vitamin D deficiency, okay? And we went ahead and measured her parathyroid hormone. And as you can see, it's 63.2, which is pretty much closer to the upper limit. And I would say it would be elevated um, when it comes to vitamin D therapy. When we look at these numbers and we see that it's closest to the upper reference, we consider this a high, a high value. Calcium, normal, 8.5. Serum calcium, ionic calcium, 1.02 is normal. So we had a normal calcium. So next thing we did is that we started giving the patient 50,000 international units a day. And this was in September 21st. So we started seeing, uh, we gave her 50,000 units right after she was uh, consulted initially. And then we waited a couple of months in the month of September, and we see that her vitamin D3, or excuse me, her 25 hydroxy vitamin D went up to 142. Now, some of us might say, oh my goodness, this is very elevated. You know, we have to watch out with uh, hypercalcemia. Well, not really, because if we look at 125 dehydroxy vitamin D, we'll see that it barely went up. It's only 21.3. So, if we really think that we're inducing hypercalcemia, as in it, which would be one of the things that most doctors would be afraid of inducing, because when they see this number over here, they say, oh my goodness, what's going on with this patient? I mean, her calcium must be high. So guess what? Look, we look at calcium, perfectly normal, perfectly normal. There was no hypercalcemia. But here's the thing. I would like you to please pay attention here. Vitamin D... 25-hydroxy uh, vitamin D went up to 142. It's above the normal reference value right over here. But if we look closely to the calcitriol, which is 125-hydroxy vitamin D, it barely went up. And guess what? Her parathyroid barely shifted. It's still very closer to the upper limit. It went down very little, but it's still closer to the upper reference. And calcium, normal. No shift. So there was no toxicity. And when we look at the symptoms of this patient, after three months of treatment, there was a very partial improvement, and the PTH did not go down, and there was no toxicity. Calcium was normal. So since there wasn't a very significant improvement in her, um, in her symptoms, we ended, I ended up increasing this dose to 100,000, as you can see right here. So... I ended up uh, measuring her vitamin D levels after a couple of months in December of 2020. And as you can see, it actually went up much higher to 282. And um, here we have the active form of vitamin D. It went up more to 42.3. So now we're talking of some major difference. And if we look at her parathyroid hormone, now we can actually see that it was cl now closer to the lower reference uh, value, which is 15 micrograms per ml and when we see this shift that means that we are breaking the resistance of the vitamin d resistance we are breaking the vitamin d resistance okay when parathyroid hormone starts to go down closer to the lower reference values this means that the vitamin d resistance is being defeated okay 
and look at calcium. There you go. Perfect. 9.3, 1.08. No toxicity caused by 100 international units of vitamin D a day. After increasing the dose, the patient got much better, symptom-free, PTH was inhibited, calcium was normal, no toxicity. So what does this mean here? If we, if we have to think about this. What does this mean? If we see a high 25-hydroxyvitamin D and a, an increase in 1,25-hydroxyvitamin D, but not as much as we would expect, this would be suggestive of a polymorphism of our gene that codes for 125 hydroxylase, correct? All right, so looking at this graph, as you guys can see, here would be before, and this would be with 50,000, this would be with 100,000. We can kind of see how it started to shift. This was the baseline, all right? Calcium was normal in all different occasions when we did the measurements, but now we have to see that 25 hydroxy vitamin D elevated. We start to see a slight increase in the 125 hydroxy vitamin D and a very little shift here in PTH, right? That was in the month of September. But then when we went up all the way to 100,000 international units a day, that's where the shift started to show up, right? So with this uh, information, we can actually do a gene polymorphism curve, as you can see right here. And guess what? Once we achieved our symptom free and our PTH went down, we repeated the rheumatoid factor or the latex reaction. And guess what? It was 9.3 international units per ml. So this means that she went into remission, right? The patient had no presence of joint pain in her knees, in her hands, in her fingers. There was no more morning stiffness. She can actually now ride a bicycle. She walks every day. And she actually put on that diet, we, she, she actually lost around 20 kilograms, which is very significant. So the patient went into remission. Now looking back over here, once we compensate to these genes, in this case this would be the, the CYP27B1 gene, because that's where the defect was found, um, we can actually make polymorphism curves. And this is what it would kind of look like if we um, paid attention to how the before, during, and after effect of high dose vitamin D looked like. Here would be in June, this would be in uh, the active disease, this would be in September, it was, we were giving 50,000, and this would be in December, it would be 100,000. So this would be uh, kind of what the representation would look uh, in regards to the polymorphism curves of the CYP27B1 gene. This would, this would be, for instance, if it would be the CYP2R1 gene, right? This would be for the VDR gene. As you can see, there are differences in regards to the curves. It would be the vitamin D binding protein gene. So anyways, so I've dedicated uh, a great portion of my research to understanding the intrinsic relationship that these vitamin D genes have with other important genes that regulate and dictate our health. As you can see, there's a very big interaction with the MTHFR gene and also with uh, vitamin D genes. So understanding this intrinsic relationship of direct and indirect relationship with the vitamin D genes with all the other genes is crucial for being able to establish what would be the most appropriate treatment for your patient who has an autoimmune disease. And unfortunately, current medicine treats everything with generalized standard doses. And that's just basically a very, you know, wrong way of approaching the problem you need to understand polymorphisms in order to, to be able to determine what we have to give to this patient, you see? And as you can see here, um, liver metabolism is extremely, extremely cru crucial in order for all of these genes to be able to work correctly, okay? 
And as you can see, for instance, what gives a lot of support for the phase one metabolism of uh, the liver uh, that enhances cytochrome P450 enzymes is alpha lipoic acid, vitamin K2, and you also have some other cofactors over here, such as vitamin B2, B3, B6, B9, B12. We already mentioned that. Magnesium, coenzyme Q10, flavonoids, phospholipids. Here we have sulforaphanes. These guys are all working all together, you see. Same thing can be said about glutathione, glycine, cysteine, methionine, glutamine, B12, NAC. I mean, it is important for us to recognize that in order for all of these genes to work appropriately, we have to have adequate liver function, okay? Phase one must be working optimal. Phase two must be working optimal. Phase three must be working optimal. Okay. So let me go ahead and explain the intrinsic, the intrinsic relationship that exists between vitamin D genes with the MTHFR gene. All right, MTHFR gene is responsible to initiate the ability to methylate in our body. So it is a gene responsible of the methylation cycle, okay? And as you can see here, we have the methylation cycle, the folate cycle, the uh, tetrahydrobioterin cycle, the urea cycle. And as we know, the urea cycle, for instance, the importance of it is that the urea cycle or also known as the ornithine cycle, converts excess ammonia into urea in the mitochondria of the liver cell. So we're ex eliminating the ammonia, in a we're transforming ammonia into urea, okay? The urea obviously forms, and then it's going to enter into the bloodstream, and this is going to be filtered out by the kidneys, and it's ultimately going to be excreted into the urine, okay? Now, most of the BH4 which is the tetrahydrobioterin, BH4, this cycle over here, comes from the methylation cycle. So it's coming over from over here. It's being barred over here, see? Where the folate molecule is used to transform BH2 into BH4. Now, BH4, tetrahydrobioterin, plays a key role in various processes in the body, including the formation of neurotransmitters. And this is something that we're going to see right now in a little bit, okay? Um, and uh, 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 besides that, also is going to be responsible for making the lipids and producing nitric oxide. And there we go. We're going to see a different relation, uh, an intrinsic relation to, between these two. You see, vitamin D induces this in gene to produce nitric oxide, and that's very important to improve blood flow and health of our blood vessels. Okay. So let me go ahead and show you now this. Here's the vitamin D link. As we know, calcitriol, or 125-hydroxyvitamin D, increases the expression of an enzyme known as tyrosine hydroxylase in our, in our adrenal medullary cells. The evidence that vitamin D increases the levels of tyrosine hydroxylase expression implies that vitamin D modulates dopaminergic processes. In other words, tyrosine hydroxylase is activated by calcitriol which ends up making dopamine. So in other words, when we have low levels of vitamin D active form, we are not upregulating tyrosine hydroxylase and in essence, we end up having low levels of dopamine. This is why dopamine, sometimes in some patients who have autoimmune diseases, you know, um, for instance, like in Parkinson's disease, what is the problem that we see in Parkinson's disease is that the patients are not making enough amounts of dopamine. Dr. Van der Leyen-Rubeda, which is a uh, physician that's also a vitamin D expert in Brazil, has treated patients who have Parkinson's disease with high loading doses of vitamin D and taking out all of those lectins and gluten and dairies and sugars from their diet and helping those patients go into remission by increasing the levels of vitamin D, as we just saw previously, right? So as you can see, there is a link here now between calcitriol, active form of vitamin D, that induces the expression of tyrosine hydroxylase, right? And the adrenal glands, and vitamin D increases the level of tyrosine hydroxylase,
which will make dopamine. Okay? Let me go ahead and repeat that. Calcitriol acts upon tyrosine hydroxylase. Tyrosine hydroxylase makes dopamine. You see, that's the very intrinsic relationship between vitamin D and uh, neurotransmitters. That's one of them. Now, another one is, for instance, serotonin. Serotonin, right over here, as you can see, right, is synthesized from tryptophan. Here we have tryptophan, right? And tryptophan hydroxylase 2, right, is, is transcriptionally activated by calcitriol. So when you have calcitriol or vitamin D active, 25-hydroxyvitamin uh, D, 125-hydroxyvitamin D, excuse me, calcitriol, the active form of vitamin D, it's going to upregulate tryptophan hydroxylase in the brain. This is going to upregulate the production of serotonin. And as we know, serotonin will eventually end up helping in the production and synthesis of melatonin. So here we have neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, melatonin, all of these are dependent on active form of vitamin D, once again. Now, let me show you this other relationship that we find between vitamin D and the GST and GPX gene, right? They're also known as the GCL and GSS genes. These are a, a group of four genes that work together, okay? This gene affects your body ability to get rid of chemicals, all right, certain toxins. For instance, it's responsible for um, eliminating certain harmful compounds from our body, such as arsenic, chlorine, hydrogen peroxide, and formaldehyde, by using glutathione. You see, GSS and GCL, which are genes that are going to upregulate certain enzymes known as glutathione synthase and glutathione cysteine ligase, it's going to make glutathione. Glutathione is going to act now on GST gene, and GPX gene, and guess what they're going to do? They're going to start eliminating all of these um, harmful chemicals, right? So if you look at this, glutathione synthesis right here, right? Adequate glutathione status in the liver upregulates vitamin D regulatory genes that make 25-hydroxylase. Oh my goodness, once again, vitamin D. Hence, converting cholecalciferol into 25-hydroxyvitamin D. So, glutathione is going to be a cofactor necessary for upregulating and activating CYP2R1 gene, which makes more 25-hydroxylase. 25-hydroxylase is going to convert uh, calcifidon to calcitriol, which is the active form of vitamin D. And there you go. Once we have this uh, active form of vitamin D circulating in our body thanks to the presence of glutathione, right? We're going to improve our tight junctions, our microbiome, immune tolerance, right? And thanks to the presence of glutathione. So glutathione and vitamin D have an intricate relationship, as you can see. And now looking at the big picture, as you guys can see here, we have the GCL, GSS. They upregulate, once again, glutathione synthase glutamate cysteine ligase, we make glutathione, glutathione activates by this route on the left, GPX, GST, this is going to upregulate glutathione peroxidase, glutathione S transferase, it's going to help out eliminate all of these toxins such as arsenic, chlorine, hydrogen peroxide, formaldehyde, and out it goes. And on the other side, we're going to upregulate CYP2R1 gene, this is going to enhance the production of calcifidyl, calcitriol. On one side, it's going to regulate the immune to immunologic tolerance that we find in the gut. This is going to help repair DNA. It's also going to help repair damaged DNA, reduce inflammation, restore immune function. And if we look at our tight junctions, it's going to make them stronger. And it's also going to help uh, in, re in regulating our microbiome. So now, we are regulating our gastrointestinal tract and we are reducing that permeability so less toxins get in and on this side of the equation and more toxins get out on this side of the equation, right? So we're not letting anything bad go inside of the body and everything that is bad, we're making it go outside of the body. So in essence, we have homeostasis restored, okay?
Now, look at looking at this graph. This is a very interesting graph. It's known as the autoimmunity and disease progression. Um, and when there is a rupture of vitamin D homeostasis. And as you can see in the bottom portion over here, we can see the age of the patients, right? And over here, the different parameters that are used to be able to monitor, okay? So if we see, as soon as we're born, our vitamin D levels throughout time start to go down, 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 right? And once we reach, let's say at the age of 14, okay? Let's say we had a gastrointestinal event, we ended up going to a restaurant, we ate something over there, all of a sudden we didn't feel very good because we think that probably that food was uh, contaminated with something and you end up getting a case of gastroenteritis and then you have diarrhea and guess what, you go to the doctor and the doctor prescribes a antibiotic, correct? So well, you get a little bit better of that antibiotic, but guess what, as we know antibiotics also kill good bacteria and bad bacteria and now you are affecting your microbiome biodiversity and this ends up causing dysbiosis so when dysbiosis starts to take place throughout the years what happens is that you have bad bacteria that are now more prevalent and now that's affecting your your mood that's also affecting the way you want to eat and now you start eating things that are actually are not very healthy and guess what happens with your diet it goes bad and guess what happens with your bmi you start increasing weight because you're eating unhealthy foods. And imagine what's also going on over here. You're having a uh, leaky gut going on. Now, if we look at this portion right over here, something that's very characteristic where it says, here we have 125 hydroxy vitamin D, which is calcitriol, and over here we have calcifidyl. So we see that calcifidyl is going low, but calcitriol is going high. high. And when we see this inversion, this is something that is a sign of active disease process. And right over here at the age of around 23 years of age, that's where the beginning of disease was showing up, okay? But you still were not very symptomatic. And once you reach the age of 30, imagine this is something that happened when you were 14 years of age. Now, when you're 30 years old, you start having all the signs and symptoms of an autoimmune disease coming out to you. You get stressed out. Your cortisol starts to go up high, right? Your vitamin D levels are low. Your body mass index is getting higher. You're getting more obese. Your diet is totally off the charts. I mean, you're eating just junk food. And guess what's going on with your microbiome? You have now moderate to severe dysbiosis. So... This is the way how usually the rupture of the vitamin D homeostasis takes place. And when, when this happens, you know, even if, if you don't have any polymorphisms, you're prone to getting all these issues. But if you do have polymorphisms, then uh, if there is a polymorphism, if there are any SNPs of vitamin D genes, then autoimmunity is even more prevalent. Okay? So... It is important when at this stage we have to do an intervention, right? So let's go ahead and do that intervention. Let's say that we start putting you on high doses of vitamin D. We change your diet. We put you on anti-inflammatory diet, gluten-free, lectin-free, dairy-free, sugar-free. And we elevate your vitamin D levels. And guess look what happens? We start increasing your calcifidon, your calcitriol. And as we know, vitamin D regulates and modulates the microbiome. So now microbiome starts getting better, right? And you start feeling better, you start eating better, right? Your body mass index starts going down and your cortisol levels start regulating again because you just elevated your vitamin D levels once again, you see? So if there are polymorphisms, if the patient does have SNPs, it is very important to compensate them always with a very high doses of vitamin D, okay? Because the body works at a different level of vitamin D. Okay. Okay. So let's go on ahead and talk now about um, high dose vitamin D therapy in the intensive care unit for COVID nineteen uh, COVID nineteen patients. As I said in the beginning of the uh, presentation, uh, we were talking about high dose vitamin D therapy in the presence of autoimmune diseases and also infectious diseases. 
So this is my experience of using high dose vitamin D3, D3 ter therapy in ICU patients who had a viral infection caused by SARS-CoV-2. And I was able to make a link with many of my patients who also had polymorphisms. Uh, I did write a study and it was in, uh, in last year in the month of June in 2021. And this was a study that was done between two countries in Brazil and Bolivia. And the study uh, was uh, done in a total of 28 patients. All of these patients were sedated and intubated. Uh, all of them received 600,000 international units of vitamin D3. And it was administered through their uh, nasogastric tube. And out of the 28 patients uh, who, had, uh, who had COVID, 26 survived. So two passed away, unfortunately. Um, this, uh, I'll give the link so you can go, you guys can go ahead and check out the, uh, the paper I wrote. It's on vitamin D wiki, uh, uh, website. I'll go ahead and give that, um, link so you guys can go ahead and access it if you guys are interested in reading it. But, um, recently in the month of January of this year, 2022, I recently saw another patient who also had COVID-19, and uh, I would like to go ahead and talk about her clinical case, okay? So here we have a 71-year-old female patient from Bolivia with a history of hypertension and diabetes type 2 and with a body mass index of 36. Uh, she used an analapril, hydrochlorothiazide, metformin, and a multivitamin such as Centrum. Uh, no prior allergies or surgeries, and the patient started having the COVID-19 symptoms on day on January 14th of 2022. Her oxygen saturation was 73 in room air, along with shortness of breath on day 18th of January, okay, of 2022. Family members reached out to me, uh, and uh, prior uh, to her hospitalization. Um, I found out about her case and they told me what I would recommend and I told them since I work with high doses of vitamin D3, I would uh, recommend, I advised giving her 600,000 international units of cholecalciferol. So this is the medication that she took, um, every pill has 100,000 international units. She took a total of six prior to being admitted to the hospital, okay? And let us not forget she had an oxygen saturation of 73 when she came in, okay? So, here we go. Uh, she received 600,000 600, international units of vitamin D3. That was given prior to her being admitted into the intensive care unit. Um, that was on the 18th of January of 2022. She was intubated, sedated and intubated. And then I asked uh, the ICU doctor to measure her vitamin D3 levels, and as you can see, on day 21 of January 21st of 2022, her vitamin D levels were 7.6, regarding regardless having received 600,000 international units of vitamin D3. So, here's something I would like to go ahead and add. The thing is, is that patients, when they receive uh, high doses of vitamin D3, um, and you start seeing that the vitamin D levels do not go up, it's probably because, it's probably most likely because they're receiving high doses of steroids. And as you know, one of the common practices that we see in intensive care unit is that we give a lot of steroids to patients who have acute respiratory distress syndrome, correct? So as we know, glucocorticoids, they upregulate 24 hydroxylase and this ends up destroying the active form of vitamin D. So we end up having low levels of vitamin D, okay? So 25 hydroxy vitamin D was 7.6. And as soon as I saw this, I said, okay, it's too low. We need to give her a second dose of 600,000 international units of vitamin D. And uh, that was given on the same day, on the 21st of January. And uh, eventually four days later, for our surprise, we started seeing that her respiratory parameters starting to get better, and the doctors extubated her on the 24th of January of 2022. And then, 
this were these were her vitals uh, as soon as she was extubated on the 24th we see could she was saturating 98 percent um her blood pressure was on 41 over 76 a little bit high on the systolic side but diastolic was normal and uh her blood her, her heart rate was 76 beats per minute so let me just go ahead and say that she was very stable okay and this is four days later after receiving the 600,000 international, the second dose. So in a total, she received 1,200,000 international units. And I had told these, I had told, I, I told uh, one of the intensive care doctors to be able to titrate and lower down the dexamethasone that they were administering uh, intravenously. So we titrated the dose in order to be able to reduce PTH levels, okay? And um, so um, we measured her vitamin D once again, her 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And as you can see, it went up to 150 nanograms per ml. This was on the 25th, one day right after we extubated her. Um, and we ended up also measuring her 125 D hydroxy vitamin D. And guess what? It went up to 32.1. Okay, so as, if we see these values right over here, 150 of 25 hydroxy vitamin D and a 125 hydroxy vitamin D of 32.1, this means that probably this patient has a polymorphism of her gene that makes 125 hydroxylase. Okay, so that would be the CYP27B1, right? So here we go. Uh, uh, a perfect clay, a perfect case of polymorphism found in the IC units by just merely looking at the vitamin D levels and the parathyroid hormone as well. Okay, PTH was inhibited almost um, once we started titrating the, the dexamethasone, but just seeing a very high 25 hydroxy vitamin D and a low, well, not low, but normal um, 125 dehydroxy is very suggestive of polymorphism of the enzyme uh, that's responsible for converting calcifidyl into calcitriol. So here we have a polymorphism that was evident, okay? So as we know, vitamin D has many, many functions, okay? It always It is always important to remember the many different functions that vitamin D offers for patients with COVID-19. First, it reduces the acute respiratory distress syndrome. Second, it regulates the cytokine storm. Three, it adjusts the modulation and activity of neutrophils. Four, it regulates the renin-angiotensin system. Five, it maintains the integrity of the pulmonary epithelial barrier. Six, it stimulates and repairs the alveoli and blood vessels. Something very important in patients who have ARDS, right? And seven, it helps reduce the state of hypercoagulability and thrombus formation, something that is very, very common in patients who get COVID-19, right? So, in essence, I always say it is important to recognize that vitamin D polymorphisms are a major contributor for COVID-19 complications and also may lead to death if left untreated. Vitamin D polymorphisms must be compensated. Not checking for vitamin D, 25 hydroxy or 125 hydroxy vitamin D, and PTH levels in the intensive care unit can be extremely detrimental for our patients. Vitamin D levels is a great indicator of prognosis and laboratory findings may reveal in many occasions the presence of an underlying polymorphism. All right. Um, so that's basically the whole presentation. I would like to go ahead and thank you guys for watching this video. Um, please uh, give me a thumbs up. Share it if you, if you can. Until next time. Take care.